Welcome into the latest episode of the Five Reasons Podcast. I'm Ethan Skolnick here, as always, with Chris Whittingham. Now that you have found us, make sure that you hit the subscribe or follow button on your favorite podcast provider. That way you'll get all of our old episodes as well as all of our new episodes as soon as they post. Also, because we're doing a Heat Stories episode today, make sure that you check out the other Heat Stories episodes in our library. Udonis Haslam, Mario Chalmers, Eric Reed, Jason Jackson, and many others. Also, check out the other 14 podcasts in our network, including The Fish Tank with O.J. McDuffie and Seth Levitt. They've got an episode coming up this week with Mark Clayton that they taped over at Ella Cafe in Plantation. It was a lot of fun. Clayton hung out with us for two hours. All right, we're going to go back to nostalgia a little bit today. I know Heat fans are a little frustrated with the start of this season. Now, we had Mario Chalmers on our pod already, but now we're having the best point guard in Miami Heat history on with us. Now, Rio may not agree with that, but I think most of our audience would. Tim Hardaway joins us from Michigan this morning. Tim, thanks for doing this. Hey, no problem. No problem at all. Thank you for having me on. And I, I, and I guarantee you, Rio will agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think so. I, I believe so. I know so. And deep down in my heart, I know he will. <laughs> Before we get into all the heat stories that everybody wants to hear about, you're in the news this week, sort of out of nowhere. What does it take? What what does your son have to do for the Knicks for you to get excited <laughs> when he does something on the court? Yeah, yeah. You know, I really want to talk about that. I played this game, you know, all my life. Played it 13 years in the NBA. So when my son plays, I'm very excited anyway. But, um, you know, they were shooting 25% from the field in the first half. They down 11. He makes a jump shot to cut it within nine at halftime. I, I, do I suppose to get excited for that? I, I, don't, I don't understand that. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I watched him play. You know, I got excited when they went to the, um, you know, NCAA and then went through all the NCAA all the way up to the final four. I was excited then. Yeah. You know, because every possession meant something, but this is a regular season. And, uh, you know, I want him to do well. I want him to play well. I want him to get, you know, score as many points as he can. But, you know, as a player and as a competitor, I've been there. You cut it within nine, and you're not, you know, you you're not, you're not playing, and you all are not playing well, and y'all not shooting well. So that was my thinking. Everybody think I should be jumping up and down, hooping and hollering, carrying on. But my objective was, all right, you made that shot. Okay, let's regroup and try to come back and play better in the second half. That's all. That was my thinking. My thinking wasn't, you know, jumping up and down like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna do that unless he in the playoffs, unless New York Knicks in the playoffs. And they plan the game. Yeah, then I jump up and down. But the regular season, no, I'm not going to do that. How have you found the experience of being a parent watching your son play basketball? I would imagine, obviously you mentioned the Final Four and all that stuff and the energy and all the positivity. How have you found that kind of, it's a bit like a coach, but almost even worse because you want your, you want your team to do well, you want your son to do well, but you don't really have any control in the matter. How have you found being able to watch your son progress in his NBA career? You know what, I'm happy for him. You know, and he's progressed each and every year, you know, and I, and I told him when he went to Atlanta Hawks before he went there, you know, I said, you know, you, you got to get better. You got to get better in your game. You got to get, get better on defense. You got to get up a pitch. You got to, it's going to be bumps and bruises on your body. You got to get over the bumps and bruises and be ready to play each and every night for your team and for yourself and show people that you, you're able to play this game. And when he went to Atlanta Hawks and they coached Bud, sent him down to the D League at the time, now it's the G League, and say, you know, first of all, you got to get in shape. Second of all, you got to show me that, you know, that you're able to play defense and that, that you're willing to play defense. And we know what you can do on the offensive end, but it's just being in shape and, and playing on the defensive end. That's where I need you at. And, you know, I just told him it was a blessing in disguise because that's what I was telling you. And now you have to go down there and show them that you are able to, to play this game in a way that you think you can play and very confident in yourself and, and show them that, you know, it, it was a mistake, but also go down there and learn and humble yourself and make sure you understand, you know, you don't want to be here ever again. But, um, you know, I'm very happy for him. I, I'm ecstatic. I love watching his games. When I watch his games, I'm critiquing his game to myself. So just in case he asks me something, because I don't call him and say, hey, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that. I stopped that when he was in high school going to his junior, uh, senior year in high school. And I say, hey, if you want my help, you know, to call me or, you know, ask me, you know, what you doing wrong? Can I help in this? Or what do I think about something? And that's why I left for that. 
but you got to learn on your own. So I critique it. So just in case he calls me and say, Hey, what you think about this or what you, what happened on that play or boom, or whatever. And I'd be able to tell him, but um, I'm just a dad and I enjoy watching him play and, and I have fun going to his games. And this is the first time since he's been in the NBA, able to be around him and just be a parent at his games because I missed that his first four or five years uh, because I was working with the Heat. I was working with the Detroit Pistons, but now I'm not working with those organizations. So now I can be a pops and go and watch him play and enjoy him. And uh, we can have fun hanging out with each other and just talking to one another and just, you know, being pops and, and son. And that's what it's all about. But when I was, when I was coaching against them, I wanted him to do well, but I wanted to win. But I always told the fellas on my team, I said, I'm in a win-win situation. I'm coaching, he's playing, and if we win, and if he plays well, I'm in a win-win situation. So that's where it's at. All right, I want to take you back to your own career a little bit. And let, let's go back to college, and let's go to the UTEP two-step. How did that originate? How did you develop that move that everybody knows? Well, I, I'm going to even take you back a little further. When I was in um, high school, grammar school, high school, uh, you know, it was I'm from Chicago. So during, um, during the winter months, you know, you couldn't go outside. It was back then in the 70s, 80s, it was cold. You're talking about, you know, below zero at times. Couldn't go outside at times because it was too cold, frostbite or whatever. And at nighttime, you don't want to, I mean, it was dark early anyway. So I used to go, I had a basement. And our basement wasn't finished. So I used to have a, a rubber ball and I used to go downstairs and I just used to dribble for a half an hour or 45 minutes just to uh, take my mind off things, you know, just to have an outlet, to, something to do. And I used to have, um, there used to be beams holding up the ceiling or whatever. It used to be beams and six feet apart. So I used to dribble around those beams and make moves around those beams and and do in and out moves, crossover moves, behind the back moves, between the leg moves, coming full speed, stop, and, and just just play like I was playing against somebody. So when I got to in high school or playing against people, we got it was easy for me to dribble and it was easy for me to get to places because I worked on on dribbling. When I got to college, uh, we lost an NIT to Washington, University of Washington, and they beat us by like boy. And Don Haskins, Hall of Fame coach uh, for UTEP, we came back in that day and that morning, and we practiced. <laughs> and we had like a, a three-hour practice. He ran us to death. And after practice, this one guy said, hey, Tim, let's play some one-on-one. I was like, uh, I don't know, man. I'm kind of tired. He said, come on, man. Let's play some one-on-one. You're not tired. You're young. You're a freshman. I said, all right, fine. So, uh. We played a one-on-one. I, we thought everybody was out the gym. So we playing one-on-one. And uh, I do the UTEP two-step or the crossover. And I go up and I dunk on the guy. And the guy up in the stands was like, and we didn't know he was in there. It was a custodian. We didn't know he was in there. He was like, wow. And we looked up and he walked away. But he, he, but he said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I, that, but that was a good move. And my buddy said, yeah, that was a good move. But he said, I can't lose like that, so let's play again. So uh, I did the move again, and uh, I didn't dunk on him this time. I just laid it up again. And he's like, man, that's a strong move. That's a strong crossover, man. How did you develop? I said, you know, I just do a move, and that's where we are in the playgrounds. We just do a move. We get to the basket, and if we have to do another move, we have to do another move. But that's where the crossover came about. I want to take you now into uh, your time in the NBA with Golden State. Uh, you were drafted there. And I was, I was just looking through some of your numbers uh, for, from your time there. And you, in a lot of ways, were ahead of your time. In the 94-95 season, you took over seven threes a game, which I imagine for that time was among the league leaders. Uh, you were there for, uh, for, I think, six seasons. Uh, what did you make of your time in yeah. Golden State? And uh, is it kind of crazy to believe that they are what they are now? Well, I always say this. We all was ahead of our time, and Don Nelson was ahead of his time. He was the innovator of what's going on today, how the game is being played today, especially with the Golden State Warriors. And at that particular time, a lot of people didn't know or didn't believe in how the game was going to evolve in the coming years. And how we was playing is exactly the 
same way Golden State Warriors are playing today. Moving, passing, without the ball. It's like a figure eight. On half court, you just figure eight from baseline up to the top of the three, into the lane, down to the baseline, up to the top. It's just a figure eight how you move. You just have people just, just pick for you. And you pick for them, back screen for them, and then come off another screen for you. It's like pick the picker. And then if you get the ball, a pick might come for you. So it's just the same way. And a lot of teams didn't know what we was doing. And we just, we, we surprised them. We just said motion. We just come out in motion. And if you switch, and if you didn't know how to switch, then we had a layup or a backdoor or a jump shot. But, you know, Nelly wanted us to get up shots. Nelly wanted us to get up threes. But, you know, it was sensible threes but play the right way and, and play together and have fun doing it. He said, you know, we want to be the highest scoring team in the NBA because a lot of teams are not going to know how to play us. And then during the season, but in, when we get to the, to the playoffs, we changed our game and we, we knew how to slow it down and we knew how to manipulate the rules so the bigs couldn't come down and guard us. They had to stay up because we had a three-point shoot at that time and Tom Tober that made shots. So it was before our time. We had a lot of, before the time today. And um, we had a lot of fun with it. And, uh, and that's where Golden State Warriors, San Antonio Spurs, everybody is playing now. And, and you know, the, sometimes it, it, it's people out there that six seven at, at center, like Draymond Green, he's playing center. And you got to match up with him playing center. You know, and and that's that's the beauty of the game. Did you welcome a trade? Like what? When like take take me through that because that was at the trade deadline, and it was one of the craziest trades Pat's ever pulled off. Because I mean, there were there were five players involved. There were five going in. There were five going out. I mean, it was all it was all over the place. Uh, after Pat, of course, told us the day before he wouldn't be making any trades, and then the next day he trades for you and four other guys. But um, like. Take me through that whole experience, and were you happy about it when you first heard about it? Yeah, you know what? I kind of instigated the trade myself. I knew it was time for me to go. You know, I love B.J. Armstrong, but I knew that he shouldn't be starting in front of me. <laughs> Point blank. <you> know? <laughs> but, uh, uh, but Rick Allenman thought differently and thought that um, – I don't know why, but he just thought that B.J. was uh, the guy to start for Golden State Warriors when, he, when Rick Allenman got there. So – but that was the wrong decision, and and um and I felt that, and uh, it was time for me to move on. I saw uh, Alonzo Morning. We we played them at Golden State, and I said, Hey, Zo, I read in the paper that you know Pat Rowley is uh, in jeopardy of messing up his playoffs, getting into the playoffs. You know, he's been in there what I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years, and it's not gonna happen this year. I said. I guarantee you, if you get me, we'll make the playoffs. That's what you tell Pat. And um, so I guess he went and told Pat. And Pat, at the time, went and um, had people come in and, you know, see me, see me play. And um, got their own ticket and, and was up in the stands and watching me play and stuff. And, and um, they went back to Pat and said, you know, he's not getting, no, he's not getting the minutes that, that he wants to get or you want him to have, but he can still play. Pat pulled off the trade. And uh, the rest was history. He made it to the uh, – even though we was in AC and we were 17 and a half games out of the A spot when I got there. Even though, he, you know, he got Walt Williams and some other guys, Tyrone Corbin. And, um, you know, we, came, we went in there and we made it work. We knew it was at stake. And we went in there and we, we had fun practicing. We had fun playing. And um, we made the playoffs. And even though we was a spot, you know, he kept his record intact. We played the Bulls. They beat us at four and three. But, hey, we, we, we made the playoffs. Before we carry on with today's episode, I want to also tell you about one of the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network, and that is Doral Toyota, which, like us, is pure South Florida. That's Doral Toyota, where you can find all your favorite Toyota models, whether you're looking for a new, used, or certified pre-owned vehicle. Doral Toyota is located at 9775 Northwest 12th Street, just a few blocks from International and Dolphin Malls. Experience the Doral difference, which means four years complimentary maintenance and roadside assistance on all new vehicles. In-house financing is available for credit-related issues. Also, if you mention five reasons when you call 305-680-1129 or 
come in the dealership, you will work with a dedicated manager, not a salesman. Unlike other dealers, Doral Toyota prides itself on an honest and transparent buying process. That's Doral Toyota, DoralToyota.com. Or stop in at 9775 Northwest 12th Street. Vamos, let's go, Doral Toyota. All right, Chris, we'll have more details on this next week as we sort of build up to it. But I want to give people a little bit of a heads up so they can mark their calendars. Our next big event for the Five Reasons Sports Network is going to be at a place called Gecko Parks. Now, that's in Weston. Now, one of the reasons we're doing this is we don't want you to have to watch the Dolphins the entire time. So this is a great new place. I've been there many, many times with my daughter. She wants to go all the time. It's a trampoline park, but they've got all kinds of other stuff, too. They've got basketball. They've got dodgeball. They've got games. They just added virtual reality. And we're going to have an event there on the 16th of December. Mark it down from 12 to 4. We're calling it Daddy's Day Out. So this is a day that you can watch football. We're going to have a bunch of TVs set up with the ticket so you can watch all of the Sunday games, not just the Dolphins. There are seven other games at 1 o'clock. And your daughter or your son is going to be having a great, great time because they're going to be on the trampolines. They're going to be on the ropes course. We've got specials for the ropes course. We've got specials for, for wall climbing, rock climbing, all that great stuff. So mark it down December 16th. I actually think this is going to be the best event that we've had yet because you get to watch football, but you also get to spend time with your family or at least tell other people in your family that you were spending time with your family. So that's a great way to go. So Gecko Parks, December 16th. Look for more details on the Five Reason Sports account. Tim, I wanted to ask you, uh, what was your impression? Uh, so obviously you mentioned uh, you told uh, you, you relayed a message that if, uh, if, if they traded for you that you'd make the playoffs, but you're thinking of the idea of playing for Miami and playing for Pat Riley. Uh, what was it actually like when you first arrived? Did, did, was it about what you expected? What, what, were, what were your impressions of working with Pat? It was all that I expected. Business-like, always prepared, working hard, day in and day out, just going out there and just – um, being professional, professional about your job, being prepared, being uh, on time, no nonsense, all that stuff. And, and that's how I grew up. You know, I grew up like that. I grew up like being prepared, wanting to play, always um, understanding the game and how we should play and how we should approach the game. You know, uh, just listening to Pat and understanding his demeanor, that's how our demeanor became. And it was so much fun. I enjoyed it. A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people didn't like how, you know, Pat or don't like how he he goes about things. But I love it because you're always prepared. You're always one step ahead. You're always prepared for something. If something goes wrong and next man up, but the, that next man up is always prepared to come in and play and to make contribute to the, to the team. And so, uh, that's what I like about Pat, and, and that's why he runs a smooth operation there with the Heat, because everybody understands that it's not about nothing except the Miami Heat and the Miami Heat organization. And you got to come in and you do your work and have no nonsense and always be prepared for anything, because anything can happen. But we're going to be professional around here. And that's what I like about it. Let me take you back to the very beginning because, I mean, you're, you're a guy that has strong views about the way, you know, to play, the right way to play. He has very strong views. I remember sitting outside some of those practices at LaSalle and going to get pizza and coming back three hours later and you guys were still going and there were still film sessions. And so take me through sort of your first battle with Pat. Like, I mean, it couldn't have been smooth right from the very beginning. So, I mean, when when did you kind of recognize, all right, this guy's a little different? I recognized he was a little different when I when I got there. Mm-hmm. When I got there, I knew he was different. I, when I got there, I knew, you know, about Pat Rowley. You know, I, I do my homework, too, just like Pat does his homework. I did my homework and understood, you know, how he goes about things, what he's about, what he likes to do, what he doesn't like to do, you know, and all that. So we saw eye to eye. I'm the point guard. I'm your quarterback out on the court. And we saw eye to eye, and we um, in the practice. Like I said, I love to, I love to play, and the practice prepared us for games. And I didn't know this. I asked him one day. We was in the elevator one time. I said, Pat, why would you be practice for two and a half hours, man? He said, The game is two and a half hours. So <laughs> I said, I didn't say nothing else after that. I was like, Okay. The only thing I thought about is, Okay, we practice for two and a half hours. If I play 
for 48 minutes. That's two and a half hours. I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to be in shape, and I'm going to outlast everybody else. But getting back to the practices, the practices, you don't think that we practiced for, for four hours. We did not practice for four hours straight, man. We was in there for four hours, but we didn't practice for four hours, okay? We practiced. We practiced for about two and a half hours. But, you know, in between that, like before practice might be a film session for about an hour. And then if you, somebody say something out the ordinary, then he has to talk. Pat will talk to you for about 45 minutes on what you said and why you said that and why you need to understand why we're doing this situation in practice. Or we would talk about a lot of things in practice, but we didn't practice for like four hours straight. It was definitely two and a half hour practices. And then you got film session or you got something else. And we talked about some other stuff. But that's about it. The other thing that you mentioned here, Tim, was that you had a conversation with Zoe to basically try to get you to Miami. I actually remember a conversation a few years later that I remember watching Eddie Jones have with Zoe at uh, at the All-Star game in 2000, Vince's All-Star game, where he was like, can you get me to Miami? And then that ended up happening the next summer. Why was it attractive for you to play with Alonzo Mourning? And how did that relationship, because, I mean, you guys were, I mean, kind of yin and yang for you know, a five or six year period with the heat where you were the two names associated with the heat more than anybody else. How did that relationship develop? How did the trust develop between the two of you? Well, I never had a big man that could, you know, post up score, uh, block shots the way he blocked shots and, 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 you know, like correct all our mistakes at the rim when we had blow bys. So I never had that, but um, you know, the, the relationship started when I got traded there. I'm a basketball player. I'm a point guard. I control the whole situation. And I knew with a big man, that's special. Uh, we go places. And you got Pat Riley, that's a, a great innovator, a great coach, a great motivator. I knew that we go somewhere. So it, 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 I fit in however you want me to fit in because I love the game of basketball. And I study the game of basketball. And I study the history of basketball. So with Pat and Alonzo, it to me, to me, when I first came in, we all fit in like if we fit in and uh, we was there, you know, five, six, seven years before that. You know, so it wasn't different for me. I, I, I knew what I was getting into. I knew what I was going to. I knew what 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 can happen. I knew how to make it happen. And um uh, and with the right pieces, you know, that we had we we made it happen. What did your relationship end up becoming with Alonzo Mourning over over the course of the years you played together? Was it obviously you guys were teammates? You went through wars, but uh, what? How would you describe your relationship now? Fam, we like fam. You know, PJ, Mash, Rashawn, Alonzo, uh, Ike Austin, Mark Strickland. You know, we we've been through the grind, man. We've been through the grind. We've been we was there. <laughs> When it first started in 96, when he put that team together in the summer of 96, and we came into practice, and he sat us down, and we was the best condition, best tough team that we was going to go out there and just beat you up and be physical and play hard. Oh, and I, I can't forget my boy, um, Dan Marvin. So uh, we, 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 we all family. We see each other, Keith Athens. We all family. We see each other. We hug each other, house family. And if today, you know, we all doing our different things or whatever. But we all keep in touch with one another. We all text one another. We, you know, happy Thanksgiving, happy Father's Day, Merry Christmas. We see each other on TV. We see see a son on TV or something like that. Man, you know, he's big or whatever, you know. We all family. And that's the way it is. And, 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 and Pat is family too. You know, we all reach out to Pat. And Mickey's family, too. You know, we all say, you know, Happy Father's Day to each other, or, you know, Merry Christmas, or, or uh, you know, Happy Thanksgiving, whatever. Happy birthday, whatever. And that's the respect we have for one another. And, uh, you know, in, in, in the trenches. Now, you know, everybody's want to look, listen for some stories or want to see if, if you know, if, if it's a love-hate thing. In the trenches, in practice, you know, you got something to say. You know, that's every team in the NBA. You know, Michael has something to say to Phil. 
Shaq has something to say to feel, you know, whatever. It, it ain't all hunky-dory in practice. Sometimes you get upset. Sometimes you get, you know, you say some words, but it, but it's in the context of the game. It's in the context of practice. It, it's in the context of work, you know, and, and everybody understand that. And then after that, it's over with. But our relationship today is great. Everybody's relationship today is great. That's one of the things that always, uh, you know, impressed me about, again, your relationship with Zoe was it did always seem like, you know, I, I, you know, maybe you didn't agree on everything, but at the end of the day, you guys, you know, kind of came together on that stuff. I want to take you to the grind because you talked about it. And I think what those teams are most associated with are the four Knicks series, just because they were so unusual to have four straight years, four series, all of them go to the last game. I don't know that we'll ever see anything like that again. So I just want to take you through a, a few circumstances here and kind of what your vantage point was on them. And, and there, I guess there's one that everybody remembers from each of the four series. So the first one, of course, is you mentioned PJ Brown, who, I mean, my experience with him was one of the most mild mannered, nicest people that you'll ever meet. And somehow he gets into it with Charlie Ward in that first series. What was your view of that and the way that you guys responded to that in that series? Well, I asked PJ, I said, PJ, what happened? <clears throat> he said, man, he undercut me. You know, he tried to take my legs from me, and I don't know why the game was over with. They was winning. They was going to win, and he undercut me and tried to take my legs out, tried to hurt me. And if you look at the video, that's exactly what it looked like, okay? And... They had the game one. I don't know what was his thinking, but he, PJ, just reacted in that way, and the rest you saw. He flipped them, and all chaos broke out with that uh, uh, thing with uh, LJ and and, um, and and Alonzo, and um, Jeff Van Gundy got his leg on Alonzo. Um, you know that transpired from when they was in Charlotte. <laughs> You know, that, that was some stuff that they was in Charlotte that they brought back, you know, to nine, whatever that year was, and we played them, and, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, and that fight broke out, okay? Uh, but you know what? All this, all that Miami Heat against the New York Knicks, it wasn't about Miami Heat against the New York Knicks. It was all about the New York Knicks against Pat Rowley. <laughs> and what he had done to get to Miami Heat. That's what that was about. That's the only thing. When he left New York to go to how he went to Miami, that's what the organization didn't like. The New York Knicks didn't like about Pat Rowley. So that's what a rivalry came about, how it came about. But, Tim, there was so much more. I mean, I, I understand that, that the Riley thing was at the core of it. And I remember Pat going back to Madison Square Garden the first time and telling the crowd to boo him more and all the signs <laughs> and all that, which is just a great scene. I mean, I don't know that we'll ever see that. But but the other thing about that series. But, he, but, but, yeah, but you know what? I'm going to tell you this. Uh, he said that, but he really didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> no i believe you about that but i believe you yeah. about that but but the, but the thing about those series and uh, you know covering every game home and road of those was yes it was pat but it was also jeff worked under pat it was also you played with spree it was lj played with zoe it was patrick and zoe were best friends and we're going out to dinner and i know that pissed pat off like there were like i mean i don't know that we'll ever see as many storylines as we saw in those series. I, I guess I, I want to ask you about a couple more events that happened in them. But overall, though, when you look back at it, I mean, you guys only won one out of the four series. You won the first one. Do you feel looking back that you guys were better than them? Uh, because because I think when, when, we, when we look at it, we're like, OK, if the Heat had just gotten past the Knicks, who knows? Maybe they you know, I know Jordan was in the way, you know, a couple of those times. But like. Maybe there was no, no. he was in a way he was in a he was in a way all those times. <laughs> 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 That's true. <laughs> That's you know? oh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna tell you this. He was he wasn't in a way when uh when they when right. um, the Knicks went to the championship when they beat uh that was but that was the uh, the uh, what you call that the uh, short season because yes. of lockout. Right, right, right. They were the eighth seed and you were the one seed and, and Michael right. wasn't there. Right. But, but that, that was but, the but I'm gonna tell you this. I'm gonna tell you this. I'm gonna tell you this. Now, if you look at it, 
they shouldn't have made the playoffs, but they somehow made it to the A spot to play us. <laughs> but if you look at it, they, 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 they should have lost, lost some of them games that was questionable for them to win to get to that A spot. If you, I mean, that, 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 I mean, that's how we look at it to get to that rivalry again. But I mean, it, 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 it was cool the way it is, the way it was, but, but to get to the A spot, it, it, it took some, took some doing to get there. For them. <laughs> no, I remember that. I remember that. All right. So the general, the general question, cause I got a couple more specifics here, but the general question, when you look back and I know the, I know their team was a little different at the end cause they'd added Spreewell and they'd added Camby. So it was a little bit different than the team they had at first, but over those four years, did you guys feel you were better? Did you just feel that you were kind of snake bit playing against them? You know, those, those four years that you did. No question. We, we thought we was better than them. Um, uh, but you know, injuries played a, played a part to it. Also, Dan Marley wasn't a hundred percent, uh, during those three, four years there, you know, and, uh, um, Zoe was coming back from injuries at times, you know, so, so it was a lot of intangibles to it, but we was definitely a better team than they were, but you know, they, they, they came out with the W. I mean, we, as hard as they played, you, you, you can't take anything away from them. They came in. They, they, I, I can't take nothing away from them. I can't, you know, talk about anybody else. But, you know, looking back at it, they, they, they played hard. They uh, they did what they had to do. They made shots. And, uh, um, you know, they got, they, they got them they got them wins. And they, and they eliminated us. So, uh, so I can't take nothing away from them. It's heartbreaking to say, even right now, to think about it right now still uh, because we had so much that we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And I think if we would have beat them, we would have beat Indiana and we would have beat Houston Rockets. I, I do feel that in my, in my heart so heartily I do, but uh, you know, it didn't go that way. And, and, and we got a little, we got a little on from it. All right. So let me give you two situations in those, then I'll allow you to move on. So you don't have to think about this anymore. Uh, two situations that Heat fans always remember. Allen Houston shot hitting the rim three times and going in, or Jamal Mashburn passing to Clarence Weatherspoon and him missing the jumper. Which of those two hurt? Which, 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 which of those two which of those two hurt more? Uh, both of them hurt it more. <laughs> you know, I, I can't I can't, you know, really say which one hurt. Um uh, uh, cause I, I I passed it to Mash, and I expected him to shoot. And um, uh, he didn't shoot. And I asked him, I said, why couldn't he shoot? He said, because uh, a Weatherspoon had a better shot. I said, okay. I mean, you, you can't fault that. So, and, and that's the way it was. Uh, but, you know, uh, the last shot that with, 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 uh, with Allen Houston, you know, I mean, that was a very, very tough but soft shot that that just trickled the rim and went in. So both of them hurt hurt equally to me. Um uh, if I had if I really had to to pick one, uh I think the Allen Houston shot that trickled in uh hurt probably the most. Yeah, that one was that one was tough. All right. So there was one other thing from those series and I remember this distinctly because I remember being at your locker before the game, this is before the game that, again, Mash passed up the shot to Weatherspoon. I've always defended him on that, by the way, Tim. O others have not, but I, you know, they, they did run a defender at him, so I kind of understood it. But, yeah. uh, you, you know, they, they did run it. I mean, this is a big debate I have with a friend of mine in the media that he, he, he's always on Mash for it. I'm like, eh, I kind of get it. But I remember before that game, standing in front of your locker, and somebody mentioned that Dick Bavetta was officiating the game that night. And I don't mm -hmm. know, if it was, I, I believe it was Mike Wise, who at the time was at the New York Times or something, had mentioned it. And, and you said something to the effect of Nick Bavetta. And I just remember you after the game coming out to give a statement of some sort about Nick Bavetta. Are, are you still upset? At, this is it's now 20 years later. Are, are, you, are you, I mean, we, we had Roddy Rothstein on our potty. He's still angry about calls on a West Coast trip from 30 years ago for the Heat's inaugural season. Are you still upset at Nick or Dick Bavetta for the officiating in that game? No, no, I'm not upset at Dick Bavetta. At that particular time, I was upset, and my emotions got to me. And um, I said, 
what I felt was right at that particular time. Um, you know, after I calmed down, you know, I saw him about a year later, whatever, and uh, and me and him talked, and um, um, we hugged, we kissed each other, and we was like, hey, you know, that was then. This is now, and um, I told him no hard feelings, and and I told him basically I'm sorry for saying that about you, basically. But no, there's no hard feelings with me about it, and that's it. I want to tell you about another great sponsor of the Five Reasons Sports Network. And for this one about PC Reboot, I'm going to speak to personal experience because I started going to Barrington about six months ago because I'm terrible with computers. I get extremely frustrated with them and all of my different devices. I was looking for somebody. I just happened to stumble upon his great reviews online. So I went to check him out over in Pembroke Pines. He's over in East Pines on 8970 Taft Street, and I had a great experience, and so I've been going back ever since. And the reason I had a great experience is not only does he know what he's doing, he's got over 20 years of experience fixing computers, he's a Microsoft certified technician, but he also fixes all types of other products, but he's honest. He told me what the problem was, he told me what it should really cost, and then, again, this week, I had another issue because my battery is not working very well on my Dell computer, so I brought it to him. Any other technician basically would have taken the money out of my pocket, double charge me. And he's like, have you checked to see if this thing's under warranty? And I'm like, uh, no, I haven't. And so I went back, checked if the thing's under warranty. And now I'm getting a free battery sent to me. And that's because again, he's honest. He's only going to fix what he thinks he needs to fix and nothing more. And he's going to charge you the right price for it. He does smartphone and tablet repair. He does game console repair. He does smart home and surveillance camera installation, website design, all of that stuff. So check out his website. Here's what it is. It's I pcreboot.com that's ipcreboot.com again 8970 Taft Street in Pines phone number is 954-442-1002 and when you call Barrington talk a little Miami sports with him he's a big Miami sports fan so the next step after uh, this era of, of Heat Knicks is uh, what happened with Alonzo and his sickness afterwards and that kind of basically uh, ending things for the two of you in Miami. What was that like to experience? And I would imagine my primary feeling would be that as professional athletes, you sort of feel impenetrable and you sort of feel impervious to the sickness of normal of normal people because you're in such top condition. You keep your, 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 your living is your body. How did you experience what happened with Alonzo then? First of all, we won the gold that year, okay? Mm -hmm. We won the gold medal in Sydney, Australia. After the game, uh, Dr. Selznick was there. We cut, he cut his tape off, and we saw that he, he poked his skin in, and it slowly came out. You know, when you poke your skin in at the bottom of your leg, it come, you know, it come back to form right away. His came back to form after about 40 seconds. And we just thought it was the tape, tape being too tight, you know, the blood pressure kind of up, whatever. We didn't think nothing of it. He didn't look uh, unhealthy. He didn't look, uh, um, he looked like he was 100%. You know, we, we didn't know. Um, uh, but the same thing happened when he got off the plane in, um, in L.A. and in Miami. But the thing was, you know, we, we just flew, you know, 20 hours, <laughs> you know, back home. So the next day, um, go run some tests, I guess. And, um, you know, he needs to run some more tests. But, uh, but that's when we, that's my recollection of, of uh, what was transpiring uh, with Zoe right after we won the gold. And we was changing clothes. He took off his tape, and and that happened. Um, that's what that's that's when I I didn't know at that particular time, but that's when I know that after everything transpired, he had the kidney ailment and everything. That um, um, I don't know how that ever happened, and 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 nobody knows how it. You know, he got the kidney ailment and anything like that. But um, that's when I we first knew that he was, you know, sick at that particular time or something was going down at that particular time. And, um, yeah, you're right. Um, that was, um, uh, that, that hurt, you know, that hurt the team that hurt, um, the organization. Um, uh, <clears throat> cause you know, we, we just signed Brian Grant and we, and we was, then he had to switch over. Brian was going to play the four. Zoe was going to play five. Then, you know, uh, uh, Eddie Jones and, 
You know, you know, we we we, we had some stuff set, but um, that hurt us. That truly hurt us. I take a look at that team, and I mean, you you kind of had a a perfectly constructed starting lineup with that group. If if Zoe had been healthy, like you said, with Brian, with Eddie, yeah. with you, you know, bringing in Mace. Also, I think you had Bruce Bowen yeah. that year, so you had a stretch player yeah. who defend. I mean, I mean, you had a lot of flexibility uh, with yeah. that group. I, I and and so I guess you know be, before we kind of move on to some post career stuff here. Um, when you look at your Heat career in totality, because I know nobody's career typically ends with the team, you know, the way they want it to, right? Like, so your your you know your career in Golden State didn't end quite the way you wanted. Although, again, you wanted a trade at the end, but you were playing behind B.J. Armstrong, which shouldn't have been happening. You know, at the end with Miami, right. they were kind of in transition. Didn't know if Zoe was going to be healthy again and all that. Um, was there any sort of regret? you know, at all when you left the heat or did you feel like, okay, with, with what we've, you know, what we accomplished, you know, we kind of did the most with what we could. We did, we did the most and we got the optimum out with everything that we had each and every year. And, um, only regret I got was, um, Pat and I, we should have worked it out where I should have stayed there instead of leaving to go to go to Dallas. I should have just stayed there. And um, instead of uh, requesting a trade because of of uh, he thought that I was um, going downhill at that particular time, and you know, no no basketball player and competitor don't want to hear that, <laughs> right. you know. Right. And um, you know, and I wanted to stay there and finish out my career there, but he wanted to go a different direction and start Anthony Carter. And I was like, ah, uh, you know, I can't, I can't come off the bench behind Anthony Carter, you know. No, I mean, my my stuff is very proven, and um, you know, that's that's as a competitor, that's the way you look at it. And um, so uh, I said, I go, I come off the bench behind Steve Nash, so <laughs> that's why I, you know, requested a trade. But you know what? I should have, um, if looking back at it, that's my regret. I should have stayed there. And, and groom Anthony Carter and uh, went out on a, on a smoother note. And, and that's the only regret I have. You know, so, bit, yeah, I, I should have stayed. Yeah, I mean, Tim, it's it's funny. When, when you talk to former guys, there are so many of them that say that same thing, you know, about sort of the end at a place where they've been for a while. And then I know you played at two other places afterwards, what, Indiana and Denver. I know if you look at right. Sha- if you look at Shaq's career, it's hard to even remember all the teams he played for at the end, right? Like he played for Cleveland, he played right. for Boston after Phoenix. So I know I know that's uh, you know that's a tough thing. But but it is interesting for you to talk about your relationship with Pat uh, in such you know sort of positive terms. And I know that a lot of guys who've left there um, have because he he was not easy on you at times. I mean I I remember I mean he had, didn't you have a three to one assist to turnover ratio clause in your contract? Yeah. Wasn't there a conditioning yeah. clause in yeah. your contract? Like there. I mean, these are not yeah. things that every organization did, but it seems like you accepted them at, at a certain point. Well, I mean, you know, you, you, you accept a lot of things because at the, you know, it's, I mean, now you don't have to accept them. You just say no, and I go to another team and get the same, you know, same money. Back then, you know, it wasn't, it, it was a lot of players on a lot of teams that was already set. And I wanted to be in Miami. So, it was, I mean, it wasn't like, and I knew that we could do things there. So it wasn't, you know, the three to one ratio. I got it. I knew, it, you know, we we came to the we came to an agreement what I could, how I get it, and and you know, you put stipulations on stuff. But if you write and doing stuff, you can get it. You know, it wasn't like I had to go above and beyond to get those those incentives. Um, it was just go out there and just play, and it, and everything take care of itself, and what you did. So, I mean, it wasn't, you know, people made a big deal out, out of it. You know, some people, their minds are not strong enough to deal with that. My mind was strong enough to deal with that because I grew up in Chicago. I had tough coaches and, and tough people around me that never gave me nothing in Chicago. I always had to work hard to get to where I, I had to go. You know, it was always a fight. It was always a struggle for me. For me. So, what Pat did in that three to one ratio or, or, uh, uh, the body fat and, uh, weight restriction, that wasn't nothing compared to how I grew up. That was like taking candy from a baby to me. 
<laughs> you know, so, so, you know, I mean, you know, I, everybody else had more uh, to talk about that than we did. Once I signed, that was it. All right, let's go. Let's do what we got to do. Just, just don't eat too much of that candy to, to make the weight clause. All right, I got some rapid fire questions for you here to close, Tim. So I'm going to go through these, these pretty quickly. Uh, here's the first one. Rank the three best players to ever come out of Chicago in order. The three best players? To ever come oh out of Chicago. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. I got one for Jazzy Russell. Okay. Isaiah Thomas. Mm -hmm. Mark Guire. There's a certain number. Th well, you leave it out two people, yourself. You said, you said three. Did three, you say three? I said three and a certain number three who still plays down here. Oh, he <laughs> you, said the three, you said the three best players, and I'm going to tell you this. Dwayne Wade is not from Chicago. <laughs> He's from Illinois. <laughs> I okay? I Robin I was gonna... <laughs> is outside of Chicago. He's not from Chicago. Okay? Like the Matrix. He's not from Chicago. He's from somewhere out north somewhere. I don't even know where that's at. <laughs> you know, he's not from Chicago. I keep telling folks that even though you came in a city and lived probably somewhere else that you that you was going to somebody's school or whatever, I don't know. You're not from Chicago, buddy. Stop it. <laughs> All right. So 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 the three best players that ever came out of Chicago, again, three best players. Mm -hmm. You look up their numbers. All right. Uh Cassie Russell. Okay. Okay, Isaiah Thomas mm -hmm. and Mark Guire. Okay. It's a lot of us, man. A lot of us that, you know, we got a lot of ball players came out of Chicago. <laughs> Teddy Trump Cummins, Terry, Teddy Grubbs, myself. Uh, you know, I, I go back to the 70s. Uh, Mo Cheeks, Ricky Green, you know. It's a lot of guys, man, that came out of Chicago that played in the NBA. So those are the three that out of Chicago. All right, so that's okay. okay. I'm, glad, I'm glad you clarified that on Dwayne because I know that's been a point of contention for a long time. So I thought I would let you do it. All right, number two question I got for you: toughest point guard matchup you had during your era? Oh man, oh man, who is that? Uh, tough match. Okay, Gary Payton and I, of mm -hmm. course, Gary Payton and I, and then um, matchup Rod Stricker in the East when I came to the East. Who was a better trash talker, you or GP? Oh, no question. GP. <laughs> GP was a better trash talker. You know, I, I was I was talking trash, but, you know, after I left Golden State, came to Miami, Pat Rowley didn't want me to talk trash. You know, he didn't want me to say anything. He We had to sit down and say, you know, he said, you know, I don't want you to be out there talking. I want you to be, you know, concentrate on what we need to do and helping us win and conserving your energy with, without talking, you know. So I was like, all right, fine. I, I won't talk. I won't talk to people. I keep my mouth closed, and I concentrate. And we, we made a pact with one another because, you know, I like I like to talk when I was on the court. I definitely like to talk when I, when I was on the court. So I said, well, let me do it in practice. He said, okay, you can do it in practice, but not in game. I said, all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you basically tortured Rex Walters in practice then. Is that how that worked? All your backups? Uh, well, uh, well, who, well, whoever was guarding me, yeah, I was talking <laughs> him. So, yeah, yeah. This is the Five Reason Sports Network, Miami Sports On Demand. We now have 15 podcasts in the network covering every professional sports team in South Florida and much more, all absolutely free. Find all of our shows on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Podbean. If you just can't get enough, become a member of our patron feed and you'll get even more exclusive content. Here's a sneak peek of what you'll hear on the upcoming episode of our newest show, The Chamber Podcast. We're now joined by Dr. Peter Marciante. There's a local sports team down here hampered by injuries right now. The team is ravaged by injuries. How much do you put of that into the training staff and the physical therapist? Unfortunately, I put a lot on it. Now what they've done is they've, they've blocked out all external doctors to have total control, and I'm not sure it's working that well. But there needs to be a little bit more freedom. and Guys need to be also take charge in, in their own health care. They can't just go to a team who's trying to manage 100 players. If you're interested in advertising your business on any of our podcasts, reach out to us at number 5 Reason Sports on Twitter. 
to stay up to date with all of our shows, enter five reasons in your search bar and then hit subscribe. Crotty told me a story. Uh, we had John Crotty on the pod, and he told me a story how you used to talk a lot of trash to him when you played against him. Uh, and then basically, but, he was, but he that was, was that. But that was that Golden State. Fight. That was a Golden State when I was at Golden State. <laughs> That's right. And, exactly. then he said, and then he said he came to Miami and he was surprised how nice you were because he, he had he wasn't expecting that when he was when he was playing out there. All right, I got uh, I got another one for you. Why why aren't you in? Because I'm looking at your numbers right now, Tim, and um, I mean I'm comparing them to other guys in your era, at your position and and some of your comps currently. Why do you think you're not in the Hall of Fame yet? Well, because of what I said in uh, what 2007 mm-hmm. um, about gay people, what I said then. That's why I'm not, and they still holding me back from that. And um, and it, there's nothing I I've been doing everything I can do to try not to uh, you know to try to make it right. And I haven't got a second chance at anything like that in people's eyes. And um, I can't do nothing about it except just keep living life and trying to um, be a parent and um, provide for my family. But yeah, that is why. But I don't that, think that is why. No, I, and I, I agree with you on that, but here's what I don't understand about that because, I mean, it's not just that you apologize for it, but you've also been an activist uh, in a positive way yeah. since. So I, I, yeah. And I don't know yeah. that a lot of people know of the work that you've done, but, I mean, you, you were very outspoken well, out there. positive it's, for it's, gay it's, marriage. Yeah, it's out there. Right, yeah. right. But I'm going to tell, tell you this. I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not bragging about it or anything like that, but a lot of people don't understand. You know, I open up a lot of people's eyes to the whole situation and, and, and help people and the NBA to get the dialogue and people to understand and people to read up on, you know, uh, why we should not, um, you know, hate people in general oh, and, why should, and why we should uh, accept them as who they are and keep moving on. And I open up that dialogue and open up people's eyes um, for us to, to, to make it better for everybody. And, um, and I took a big hit and I'm still taking a big hit and I'm still, um, 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 being, um, uh, not crucified, but still being, um, um, you know, outcast for what I said. Well, to that end. So what's the, the final one for you here, Tim? So what, what's next for you? I know like you, you've been in a like you mentioned, you were in the Pistons organization, you were in the heat organization, does it interest you to get back into the game in the capacity you were in before? Does it interest you in being part of the Heat organization again at some point? Like, what, where, where do your interests – I mean, you're not an old man at this point. You're in your early 50s. you still got a lot to contribute in that way. What, what would you like to do next? Well, you know what? I like, I like to help put a team together. I know talent. I know, uh, how to, you know how to put a team together. I know, you know who can play, who can't play, you know uh, – how to, uh, I know the salary cap, I know, uh, you know, the ins and outs of trades and how to make, you know, how to put a team together. And uh, that's what I want to do. I want to be, you know, a general manager, assistant general manager, uh, uh, development of player personnel, head scout, you know, whatever. But I do want to be in the front office and I do want to uh, help a team out. And that, that, that's my motivation right now. And um, like I said, I, I, you know, I've been doing this all my life, putting, you know, putting teams together and saying who can play and who can't play. Mm-hmm. And um, um, so I've, I've been doing this all my life. And, um, and that's what I want to continue to do. And, um, you know, that, that's it. You know, basketball is my life. And like I said before, you know, uh, uh, I'm just being, uh, uh, you know, people are just, you know, shutting me out right now because of that. But you still have relationships in the game, though, right? I mean, so I mean, I'm mean, plenty yeah, of I think I, you know. You you still you still got I still got relationships, mm-hmm. but you know, some people are scared to pull the trigger, right? You know, <laughs> right. Right. you know, relationships. You know, relationships is relationships for pulling the trigger and bringing me in is mm-hmm. something totally different. You know, I mean, I know I I see people getting back into situations when they were uh, uh, being racist, mm-hmm. you know, but they back in the organization, uh, in a organization, doing stuff in a organization, and um, and uh, people forgot about that. Uh, but 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 I mean, you know, he got emails of him talking about you know black folks, 
you mm-hmm. know, being racist towards black folks, but he's back in the organ in a organization and doing, you know, what he you know, doing what he he he's doing. So, you know, you got to have somebody that can that can pull that trigger and that's it. And I, you know, nobody wanna pull the trigger with me. All right, Tim Hardaway. Basketball is his life, as he says. Um, obviously, you can uh, you can check him out in the stands, watching his son from time to time, and even occasionally getting excited. Timmy, we really appreciate the time with you today. <laughs> really, I, I I know the fans I know the fans will enjoy this, and it was great. And I know uh, I'm gonna have to ask Rio directly, but it was great to have the best point guard in Heat history uh, here on the podcast. No so question. Thanks, thanks a lot for doing it. No question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Y'all yeah, take care. Thank you for listening to the Fire in the Podcast. Thank you so much.